Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us as um, we evolve together. And in this series, we're showcasing business leaders and their approach to workforce innovation and really what's next. Today, I have a very, very special guest who is coming from across the country and a friend of mine from Seattle. And Alex, could you please take a moment to introduce yourself and your company? Sure. Uh, my name is Alex Lang, and I'm the CEO of Forbes Global Properties. Um, we've actually known each other for quite some time. And going back to my stint prior at Forbes Global Properties, um, I ran a company called Upstream, which was a national data management platform. Think of it as trying to create standards for what you know as the MLS. And then prior to that, I we actually met when I was um, working and associated with the National Association of Realtors and their second century ventures and their reach program. So the accelerator they had. So yeah, it's been it's been nice to to catch up with you. It's been a while. Yeah. And and you know what's so funny is everybody has every business has had different effects of obviously the pandemic. And how has it, you know, how are you doing with this within this time frame? How has it affected you? Ah, you know, it's really it's it's interesting because we we're a bit unique and i think that plays into not only how we how we operate during the pandemic but how we'll operate outside you know after the pandemic but you know i think we're what what's unique about us is that we're actually were formed and we launched during the pandemic i mean so we didn't have anything we weren't coming from anything that we had to change because we started in this environment right so it, it's it's been different i mean our entire team from the very beginning has been virtual i mean from start um, we have team members in New York, clearly I'm in Seattle. We have team members in LA. My technically my office is in Los Angeles, even though I maybe only spend about six days a month in it. Um, so it's, it's, it's been there and there's literally 50% of my, my, my organization I've never actually met in person. Wow. That's incredible. And did my, you my see CMO and my head and my VP of, uh, of customer service, literally I've never actually, I've only done zoom. I've never actually met them in person. Wow. And and did you see an opportunity or did you already have this so far in the works that you decided to push it forward anyway? Uh, this, it, we, well, okay. So the, it's interesting because we, we are partnered with Forbes and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but you know, we, we definitely had some contractual mandates for lunch. Um, so I had to launch when I did, whether I liked it or not. Um, so it was just like, you know, it's, you know, it's fun. It's fine. Cause you know, if you don't have decision fatigue, right. Like you're just sort of, it's a forcing function. Like I have to do this and we have to build it this way. Um, it's, it's interesting. Right. So we, we've decided to partner with Forbes because we wanted to create this. It's a Forbes Global properties, literally it's a luxury marketing platform that we work with the, the, the firms in the country that specifically focus on say like 2 million and above. Um, listings. So when I mean, we have listings that are three hundred million dollars on the site, and 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 we are worldwide, international based. Um, we have, I'd say, fifty percent of our members are are non US. Um, but that 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 helped us a bit um, in, in in how we launched. So again, forcing function. I had to hit a date. We made it happen. We just started hiring people, and we brought. You know, we just said, who's the best person since it doesn't really matter where they live because they're not going to be able to come to an office anyway. Right. Um, and that, and that's sort of how it happened. You know, we were fortunate that the luxury real estate market in the United States actually did really well and they thrived where that wasn't the case for many of our international you know, members like Mexico and Spain got hammered in 2020. Um, and, but they're 50% of our client. So again, international is probably 50% of our membership, but um, since we launched in December, I've been able to sort of lean in on just the U.S. sales because every single one of our luxury market members says 2020 was the, one of the best years ever in like the history of ever, right? Which is not the case for general real estate, and right. um, but for luxury on the luxury end, it has been. They did really quite well. Um, so I've just been able to lean on that a little bit. That's great. And and obviously you launched during the pandemic. Did you make any pivots or have any challenges that made you make changes because of it or yeah, you know, we it, it it's it's interesting what what we're learning. Um, so fundamentally, because of the way our our company is structured and what we sell, it's an enterprise sale, for lack of a better word, if you think of it traditionally, right? And it's like any other enterprise, and especially enterprise sales plus real estate 
it is such a traditional, what we say is belly to belly kind of affair, right? Where like conferences were the way you sold. Like you might do a lot of email back and forth and maybe do a demo, but the reality is, is you, you end up going to a conference and, you know, we, it's, I, ironically, we just call it lobby con. You, you never attend a single session. You just sit in a lobby and you do deals at conferences in hand to hand shake. That's how it works over a martini or whatever. And that's gone. And it completely changed how we would think about it because, you know, LobbyCon isn't a thing anymore because it doesn't work all these virtual conferences. You can't really, that's not the place you're going to like do a handshake deal. It's just not going right. to happen, right? Uh, you know, now everything is done over Zoom. And I mean, I could use, I looked at my calendar before we started this. I had 30 Zoom meetings on a calendar this week. Ugh. Right? And it's just, and I'm sure other people have it worse. It's just like back to back to back to back Zoom meetings. Um, and so, you know, for us, we had to think through, think that through and make sure like literally everybody had really good equipment. And then we made sure that we actually had a design firm come in and make super professional backgrounds, which normally, if I was in a Zoom environment, I would have it behind me, has all the Forbes, you know, glitz and glory behind me. Uh, <laughs> but that's what we, we did because it was just like, we can't, I mean, you think about it. it and suddenly everybody in their mother has become a, a video conferencing expert. Yes, yeah, of course. You see all the squirrely funny things with, you know, <laughs> what's behind you, you know, there's a cat behind you, or you like your decorating is all over the place. And we just had to really think that through. It's like, listen, this is a this is a hundred year old iconic brand. Yeah. Right. And we are trying to not only market and talk to the affluent, you know, buyers and you know, agents and stuff who do with, deal with you know affluent sales, but we're attracting those buyers and sellers, right? Which now, if you think about it, is has changed. The, so that cohort of affluent and buyers and sellers has grown dramatically and it's grown really fast, but it's skewing younger and younger. I don't know if it's because of inheritance or dot com or or or, but it is skewing younger and younger. And so it's like let we need to make sure that we represent an image that not only speaks to so like an an older affluent family, right, and also to the guys who want to be on the thirty under thirty list. And everything in between, right? So, how do you do that from a branding perspective and imagery and everything that you do, right? So that was that was always a big deal for us, and, that, and we had to pivot and think about that, right? Yeah. Well, now you have your puppy right in your zooms too. Yeah. See, and, and things like that happen now. I, I, ironically, they, they become like talking points, and people like it. And I, I love it. It feels I love a little it. more, I don't know, human, right? <laughs> Exactly. I think I think it's it, it's finally acceptable to have your kids kind of running through the background or your dog jumping under your desk. And <laughs> it was never acceptable. As long as they're not jumping on your lap and you're, you're able to still get things done, it's okay. Right? Yeah, exactly. So what is your take right now on the residential real estate market? Do you, you know, do you think there's, you know, how it's going to affect the economy? What are your thoughts in general? Uh, well, I think there's a handful of things that are happening right now. I mean, it, it, it is this weird nexus of interest rates are at an all-time low still. The market, people are basically, I mean, you, you see the news articles say everybody's moving into, you know, out of the out of the cities, into the suburbs and out in the, you know, everybody's going to, you know, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho now or whatever, right? Because, but, but if you look at the market and the inventory and some of these shifts, the reality is people are sitting. That's the one thing I was surprised. Like say, the savings rate in the United States is as high as it's the highest it's been since the 60s. Okay. So people are literally their 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 home prices are are rising really fast, right? But they're not they're not selling because that means they're gonna have to buy something in a market where the home prices are raising really fast, right? So people are almost sheltering in place, and which is making this crazy inventory problem which is then raising the prices again. So it's making it really hard for people now to make that thought and make that move and make that shift, right? Because yes, they can sell their house for more money, but then I have to buy a house that has more money. Um, I, I, I'm interested to see what happens when the moratoriums change on people being able to sort of push back their mortgage. Um, and what I think there's a, there's a huge pent up demand of pre foreclosures that are out there. And I think they're going to hit the market and it'll be interesting to see how the banks manage and handle that. Um, I, I have seen some, some data that suggests that the government may step in and not do things financially. I mean, they might, I, I, I'm not sure how we're going to recover from that if we keep spending money, but 
um, they're, they're talking about coming in and actually working with the lenders themselves and, and almost finding them if they don't find a way to help the consumer figure, you know, like work with them to payment plans or whatever. But it's like, you can't just take people out of their homes. Right. And that's what they're doing. But it will still be hard. It's going to be hard. I think there's going to be a, a rush of inventory that will hit and it's going to be sort of like foreclosures. So it's going to be REOs, bank owned properties. And how will that happen? How will that sort of play out? Um, I don't know. I think prices are still going to be dramatically rising for like another year still before we see well, it. And, and, and do you, are you concerned that, you know, in a few years, if somebody that buys a house right now and pays, it's just say 20, 25% more is going to be in another horrible position because if they need to sell their house, they're never going to get that value out. I mean, yeah. that happened to us before. <laughs> I think it will happen again. I mean, we, this is all cycles, right? I think it will happen again and it'll be in an extreme level. Um, and hopefully they can just shelter in place and weather it. Right. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah. But and, the, you know, all it takes is, I mean, the problem is, yes, the American saving rate is higher than it's ever been, but it's not extreme amounts of money. Right. So it, all it takes is great. Now I'm in a million dollar mortgage because in, in, for an 18 front hundred square foot house, I mean, it's insane. Right. And I lose my job. Then what happens? Right. Right. Do I have enough reserves to like hold out or am I going to have to, you know, be upside down when I dump the house? I mean, it's I, I think there's going to be a uh, a tsunami of pre foreclosures that are going to hit the market. Um, and they're going to all have deferred maintenance and they're all going to have and they're going to have this inventory issue and people are still going to pop in. And so people are just going to like buy these houses sight unseen because they can. And all those contingencies will be thrown out the window and yep. people are going to be buying and they're going to be buying things that have furnaces dying, roofs leaking and everything else in between. And what that means, I mean, the, right. there's, there's, always, like you know, there's opportunity in these crazy <laughs> shifts, but um, it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Now, obviously, Forbes Global Properties has has grown significantly since your launch in 2020. Yep. And where are you seeing the most growth? Um, it's interesting. I'm seeing a ton of inquiry internationally. I mean, we are, like I said, I'm leaning into the U.S. sales, one, because I know the U.S. market really well, and two, um, they've done well. Um, so we, you know, but that whole like lower corridor of Texas, New Mexico, lots of activity there. Internationally, I'm getting a ton of inquiries internationally, especially because I think they know that Forbes name really well and, and, and it resonates with them. And they're like, I want the Forbes branding on my company. Right. Um, so I get a lot of that. A lot, a lot of Spain, a lot of, of Switzerland, a lot of France, um, not a lot of South America. So it's really like Europe, European Union and the south of, of the U.S. Lots, lots of inquiries all up and down. Like I said, like New Mexico, California, Texas, um, less than things like Boston, Connecticut, New York. Not, not as much, um, not as much activity um, in Pittsburgh. Um, but, <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. Well, you know, a lot of business leaders are, are really in a position where they didn't start in the pandemic. Right. Um, you know, they've been around <laughs> and they're in a unique situation where they're trying to figure out what to do next. Do you have ah. any advice for business leaders today? Well, you know, I do. Um, you need to fundamentally assume that this hybrid sort of in person remote scenario is going to be the de facto standard forevermore. It's not going to be back to the way it used to be ever. Um, Cause I think, I mean, there, and you, if you assume, I mean, people are going to want to come back to the office because we crave connection. Right. And I think we all have a bit of zoom fatigue if you would. Um, but at the same time, there are going to be people who just would rather like we've been doing it for so long. It's kind of baked into our routines now. Right. right? And I think there will be people who just want to be remote. And I think you're just going to have to deal I, I mean, I just like you're gonna do it. And, it, and it's interesting because honestly, personally, I am a prefer. I prefer having people in the office, and I actually believe, whether it's true or not, I believe I can probably get at least twenty five percent more throughput with a team that's in the office than when they're all scattered remotely. I don't have the data. It's just that that's my gut feel, right? Now, but I had to. I like at some point, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna have to get used to it and embrace because it's never going to come to back to what you expect and what you'd hope. Um, and I think you can embrace it though. I and mean, if you do, there's, there are tons of advantages to it. I mean, here's the thing. 
think about this. You now have, and I and I did I had, since we were born in the pandemic, it I, it was just availed to me, you know, whether I liked it or not. But suddenly, like I have an entire world to recruit from. I'm not just I can now find the best candidate. Period. I'm not reduced to the best candidate in Seattle or the best candidate who's willing to move to Seattle. Right? right. I can just like, you're in New York, you want to stay in New York and you're awesome. I want you. Right. I mean, it, you can do that now. Um, I think there's really interesting opportunities to cross train your teams. And I, and here's what I mean. Like meetings are being created as a zoom or a video meeting as a default. Now it's just like the default way to do it. Right. Which pre pandemic, you, what you use zoom for like a webinar. Right. Right. Or a demo. Right. You didn't like have every single meeting just default to a Zoom meeting. Right. So if you cross train all of your team members, suddenly my my help desk person almost is like representing the brand. Right. So right. to give them the right language and train like almost like everybody's a salesperson now. Everybody is a customer retention problem person now. Right. You're not just the QA guy on my co on my development team. Right. You're everybody is now a representation of your brand because they're all sitting here in videos with clients, with customers, uh, which, you know, sometimes might be scary. But the reality is like it's an opportunity Turn them like train them all, train them all to understand your value, be able to articulate your value proposition and to be able to help. And you and you and you're going to create ambassador and just goodwill with your customers versus just somewhere someone behind an email or someone behind a phone call. Right. It's just different. There's a little bit more human to it. It's and, yes. and you might as well. Um, I think everybody just just do it. Invest in good equipment. I mean, there's it surprises me after a year. There's still people with fuzzy thing, you know, like old cameras and they got God knows what. And it's not, it's not that expensive to put in <laughs> no. to get the decent equipment. Right. And it makes a huge difference, too. It, it, it does. Or- Again, it's the brand it, there. Yeah. Everybody's representing your company now in a way that wasn't the case a year ago. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, I was I was on a call recently, and the person was like sitting in a chair right in front of their bed, and it was it was quite awkward because you could see the whole bed in the background, and it's like right. it just was it was just a weird situation. So you'd think right. that there's going to be some policies around, you know, what you see at some point too, um, because it's 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 very interesting. It's distracting, right? Um, depending on what it is. So, um, are you? Do you have any concerns with the labor pool? Um, because what I'm hearing from a lot of CEOs around the country is that they're concerned with the talent. Um, a lot of people still aren't working and there's not a lot of opportunity out there. Um, I think it depends on the industry in which you operate, right? Because I think the opportunities that were eliminated because of the pandemic had, I mean, if I'm in, if you're in retail, absolutely. Right. You just got crushed. The retail sector just got crushed. Knowledge workers didn't really get hammered that much because they were just going to work remotely, right? So just, I, I think it depends. I mean, I do worry about how how we as a society can help every, you know, like as all we're all in it together, how do we like help keep the economy running? Yeah. Um, but, and, and who in the economy is getting hit is is interesting, right? It's like, it's, too, it's really like, I'm in Seattle. Okay, I got Google and Microsoft in my back door, right? I'm literally ne- I'm down the street from a 40,000 person Microsoft campus. They don't think about restaurant workers, right? They've all been just working from home on their laptops the way they've been every single day since before the pandemic and it didn't hit them. So like, I think they're almost blind to it. Yeah. Right. And I think that I think, and, 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 they're, and they're all great people and who would be wanting, willing to like figure out how to help. I just don't think people get it. I think we're, right. we've become super numb about what's around us and what's happening. And we're all tired. It's kind of like you watch the news every day and it's like, okay, the CDC has put us in phase two, phase three, phase one. And you're so tired of hearing it. Like I'm numb to it. Like I don't even know what it means anymore. Right. Like what, what is phase two again? What's phase three? I don't, I don't even know. It's just like, I've lost track. I've lost track. My biggest takeaway from the pandemic that is, I think every single person should do Um before pre-pandemic, like I said, everybody's a Zoom expert now, right? But before it, we'd use it in as organizations to basically speak at our client base. We'd be webinars and stuff, and we're just talking to you, right? One of the things that we created, um, we created at Force Globe Property a marketing roundtable 
where every single client that we have, their marketing managers, we all get together every single month in one giant Zoom or team meeting. And we all share best practices. They all share with each other the best way to use the brand. And it that concept of getting them all in a room together and like, as your customers and how better to use your product, how you, I mean, you can use it for education, whatever, but it's really like, let it be their forum. It's super sticky. I bet. It's super sticky and they love it. And, and then you think about, if you're thinking about like churn or people leaving, it's like, they can't be part of this group if they're not still your customer because it's based on that. Right. And it ends up being really, really, so now we're actually creating one for our product and tech side too, and just get all the technicians together. And they're, sh they're sharing some having nothing to do with us. Like, <laughs> I use this crazy JSON script and it worked this way to make a video work on their phone. And they're all teaching each other and it's awesome. Oh, and, it's, yeah. and, and people are just used to it. They're just used to getting on Zoom meetings where you wouldn't, we didn't do this before. We did. And it wasn't acceptable and you just like dreaded and it was it's, hard to connect and to figure out what to do. And now it just, it's one click and you're pretty much awesome. functioning. It, it, is, it is awesome to see those communities grow because again, they want that connection as well. And to be able to, for a manager, a marketing person to talk to another marketing person and talk to another marketing person and be able to share is awesome. I mean, it's just yeah. absolutely awesome. So if you have that ability, create it. Because I think it's, we didn't do it on purpose. We did it by accident. And I think it's probably the best feature of our company besides the brand that is Forbes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? You are always full of amazing advice. And you know, I have personally taken your advice in the past. Do you remember your, your oh, yeah. big advice to me? And it was, you know, having bandwidth as a human being and taking time to take care of yourself. Yep. And I think so many people in leadership positions forget about themselves. You know, they're focused on their business. They're focused on their family. And at the in the grand scheme of things, if you don't take care of you, you can't take care of anything else ultimately you can. To start falling apart. And you've Absolutely given me true. amazing advice over the years. And thank you for all the advice you've given to everybody else today as well. Yeah. I'm always happy to, to help and I'm here for you whenever you need. Thank you. Talk right. to you soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.